reaction weekend. Hey, have you ever noticed that sometimes our reaction uh, to certain things is, is not the best? Anybody else have a poor first response sometimes? Just me? Like if you get cut off in traffic, I heard a pastor tell this story uh, a couple weeks ago. This pastor was driving to church and uh, a guy cut him off in traffic. So they began a little, a little, uh, a little road rage, a little, little road warfare, if you will. They began honking each other. The guy flipped him off. And this pastor's got his family and his kids in the car, but he flies into a rage. He flips the other guy off. I would never do that. <laughs> Externally. <laughs> in my heart, but not out loud. And so he flips him off, and they're honking, and they're yelling, and they're going back and forth. But then it begins to get a little awkward and actually a little scary because the guy begins to follow him. So it's Sunday morning, so he's speeding up, he's making turns, and the guy is following him every step of the way. And they're in a neighborhood, and they go through a turn, and they, they take another turn. And this guy's like, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to call uh, the police. Uh, uh, I'm gonna pull, pull in the parking lot. Well, this church had, had a permanent facility, and the, the staff parking was in the back, and you actually had to go through some cones. And so he's like, well, that, that's fine. I'll just lose him, because when I go back into the pastor's parking, he won't be able to follow me. So he speeds back there. They, they put the cones, and, and the guy goes off in the other direction. He's like, man, that was close. I really thought that, that, that something bad was gonna happen. The pastor's on the front row getting ready to worship. He walks up the steps, turns to greet the audience and sees the first time family on the front row as they stand up and exit the building because the reaction wasn't very good. You ever been in that moment where you just weren't impressed maybe a little embarrassed by your own reaction. That happened to me this week. I, I, can't, uh, I can't just make fun of another pastor. I was going through security, flying back from Birmingham, Alabama, my home state, my hometown, and uh, so I can say the things that I'm about to say about it. They haven't caught up with the times. Um, TSA and Birmingham are my favorite people in the world now. Uh, I go through, and apparently in Birmingham, you have to take out all of your food as well as your toiletries. Never heard that before. I travel three weeks out of the month, been in about every airport in America, and they're making me take my protein bars out. They actually took one of my protein bars. They said, sir, you can't have this. Like, that's sealed. That's mine. They pulled out my other bag, my, my roll-on, uh, carry-on, and they began to go through it, which I'm just always a big fan of. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like I spent about 20 minutes folding everything neatly so I didn't have to rewash it and iron it when I got home, but I really appreciate you going through my stuff like I'm a criminal. I really appreciate that a lot. They get to a, 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 a container of, of hair gel, which as you can tell is very important to me. And this had just happened weeks before at Orlando, and I was able to sweet talk the TSA agent into letting me pour it out so it had less than three ounces. It is a clear container with clearly, hence clear, less than three ounces, about this much left. The guy says, I'm gonna have to take this from you. I said, no, sir, you're not. It's not, you're fine. <laughs> I'm actually on a return trip, as you can see by my itinerary. I brought this with me. I just got it through Orlando. I've been traveling with the same container for about four weeks. He's like, I'm gonna have to take it or you can check it or go put it in your car. Well, the, the bad news is I don't have a car. I rented one and it's gone and I'm not gonna go check it because if you've ever waited for your bags in Orlando, you know that's about an hour out of your life that you're never getting back. And so I'm gonna carry this on and I would like to take this. Can I please speak with your supervisor? <laughs> supervisor comes over and he is just as friendly as the first guy. Really see the problem with TSA Birmingham when I met the supervisor. I mean, he is just just a bundle of joy. And so he came over and he said, sir, what seems to be the problem? I said, this guy clearly is, is not, 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 not listening to me. I'm very polite, smiling at this point still. And I said, this is, uh, this is a return trip. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and need to carry this on. He's like, no, sir. I'm like, sir, you can, you can tell that it's not more than three ounces. He says, what do you want me to do? Do you think my arms calibrate weight? I said, no, but your eyes do. Like, look at it. <laughs> not a good response. At that moment, I sensed the tension. I said, you're the boss. I'm gonna throw this away. You guys have a great day. I'm never coming back to Birmingham. 
my, my reaction was, was, was poor. Not proud of it. A few years ago would have been a lot worse. I stayed very honoring and very, very, very thoughtful. And I thought I'm gonna get arrested and miss this flight or I'm just gonna let you take my hair stuff. And I decided that $14.99 was not worth being arrested. Come on, somebody. My reaction was, was poor. And if we're not careful as, as Christians, we could be in the car, we could be at TSA, we could be at church, we could be at our business. And our reaction may not be what we want it to be. So I wanna talk about what, what we do as a church. How, how do we respond to things? How do we react? We are on a reaction journey, if you will, because once we've decided to follow Jesus, and hopefully we all have in here, if you haven't, we are, we're gonna pray at the end of service and give you an opportunity to change that today. But on this reaction journey, it's gonna be full of TSA agents. It's gonna be full of people cutting you off in traffic. It's gonna be full of mountaintop moments and valley moments. It's a, it's a roller coaster. We have good times and we have bad times. What I wanna to talk to you about today in our brief time together is what do we need on our reaction journey? What are the things that we need to, to experience the good times well and to make it through the storms of life or make it through the tough times, surviving, looking to Jesus and coming out on the other side better? I wanna take you to a story in the New Testament. If you got your Bibles, we're gonna be in Matthew chapter 14, really a story that we're all familiar with, but I wanna give you some context today and, and maybe hopefully bring some things that you, you've never seen before. Matthew 14 in the New Living Translation, let's start reading. Uh, in verse uh, 24. This is uh, the story where Peter uh, saw Jesus on the water and, and Jesus called out to him and Peter walked on watch. Says, Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. They were in a, in a valley type moment. They were in a storm for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. That's impressive. I don't know if you've ever tried that before. Anybody ever tried to run really fast on the water just to see? Come on, you've tried it before. It looks silly, you can't do it. It's not possible, that's a miracle. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid. He said, take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went out over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? I wanna give you some context here to the disciples' journey. The Bible uh, is written as a, as, a, as a narrative and a lot of times we take out passages and we may read them or even teach them out of context. This is a crazy miracle story. Two people walked on water. That's amazing, that's miraculous, that's supernatural. That is, that is a moment. I need to catch you up what's happening just in Matthew chapter 14. The beginning of Matthew 14, John the Baptist has been beheaded. So Jesus, the one that, the, Jesus' cousin, the one that paved the way for Jesus, the, the man that baptized Jesus, a, a man that many followers of Jesus and the way would have, would have looked to as an example, has lost his life. Jesus has lost one of his best friends. The disciples have lost a man that they would have looked up to. The very next passage is when they feed 5,000 people with a couple of fish and some loaves of bread. Do you see where I'm going? They went from a, a moment where they didn't know what God would do, they didn't know what was going on, a moment of, uh, of tragedy, a moment of, of grieving, to a mountaintop moment where Jesus fed 5,000 people. Right off of that, Jesus sends them out and they're in the middle of a storm at 3 a.m. Do you see the tug of war of emotions? Do you see that even the disciples went through a lot of things? Have you ever been there where you went from, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened, what am I gonna do, to a mountaintop back to a valley? They, they went through similar things that we go through. I don't know what your life feels like, but sometimes I don't know what's up and what's down. And now they see, they see Peter and Jesus walking on the water. They were on a crazy journey. That is a crazy week. And I don't know if you're new to Action Church, maybe you've been here for a while, but this journey that we've signed up for, 
this mission that we have taken to reach and connect people in Central Florida. This mission, this, this journey that we've decided to go on to reach and connect people in our state, in our country, and around the world, it is a crazy journey. It's gonna be full of tragedy, it's gonna be full of heartache, but it's gonna be full of some of the most amazing miracles you've ever seen in your life. And so what I wanna talk about today is how do we prepare for the journey? Like, what do we need to get ready to do all that God is calling us to do? I found three things in this story that I think will relate to our reaction journey. The first one, if you'll follow along, is in verse 27. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. If you're taking notes in here today, I want you to write down that on our reaction journey, we need courage. We need courage. Courage. I want to take these, these points today and I want to give you some of our values, some of our reaction statements. The one here is that we, we need faith. And the reaction statement is number five that we believe for immeasurably more, not just enough. We believe for immeasurably more. See, Jesus walking on the water, Peter could have said, Hey, Jesus, come to me. Like that would have been practical. If he just would have looked over the bow and had faith, if he just would have looked over the bow and not been scared, we would probably count that as a win. Like the other disciple says, it's a ghost, they were terrified. If Peter just would have stood there with courage and says, no, that's Jesus, that would have been enough. But at Action Church, we believe for immeasurably more, not just enough. I wanna be a group of people like Peter that it's not just enough for Jesus to be out there, but if Jesus is out there, I wanna be out there. You may say it's waves and it's, it's, it's I don't know what's gonna happen and I don't know what's gonna, that is the best place to follow Jesus because when you don't know where you're going and when you don't know what's gonna happen, the only thing you can do is rely on Jesus Christ. Can we be a group of people that take some courage and get out of the boat? I grew up hearing that Peter was a person of little faith because he began to sink. Peter's the only one that got out of the boat. And I'd rather look foolish following Jesus than look great sitting on the shore. I'd rather sink 10 times out of 10 trying to follow Jesus and doing something great for him and stay in my comfort zone and just let this life and this mission and this journey pass me by. I need some courage. Hey, church, if you don't have courage, that's why we have small groups. That's why we have teams. One of our reaction statements is we are encouragers. And an encourage is simply someone that adds courage to your journey. If you don't have somebody adding courage to your journey, you're doing it wrong. Because there are times where we don't have faith. We are, there are times where I don't know what's right and what's left and I don't know what to do. That's why we have people in our life that we trust and they can speak to us and they can add courage to our journey. You need somebody to add courage. I'll give you an example. I was playing in a golf tournament with my dad. My dad and I, every single July, go out to the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs and play in John Bevere, who's one of my great friends, great mentors. He has a big fundraiser that they raise millions of dollars to send resources all over the world uh, in the developing world. And your generosity, we are a partner with Messenger International, a great ministry and a great event. We're out there every year, and it just so happens that we've won the event three years in a row, not... That's not important. Uh, then I shot 65 on my own ball to win by one on the last day. That really has nothing to do with the story. I just have a microphone and would like you to know that we had a great week two weeks ago. <laughs> somebody's leaving the church for sure. Uh, every time I brag, somebody's like, I hate this place, and they leave. And so we love you, and we'll see you in heaven. Um, Cause we worked really hard for that championship. I have the trophy, Kingston's gonna break it next week. It's gonna be awesome. Uh, we've won three in a row. He's broken three trophies in a row. That's a fact. All in shambles. That's why we don't play for trophies. We play for the kingdom. Jesus juke. That's hashtag Jesus juke. Hey, if you're ever in a conversation with somebody and you don't like where it's going, you just make it real spiritual in a hurry. They got nothing to say. You play for earthly trophies. I play for the things that are from above, the jewels in heaven. A crown of righteousness will be whatever. Just rambling nonsense. 
<laughs> so dumb. Here's the point. Here's the point. It's a partner event. And there's something amazing when you have a partner uh, in golf. Because in golf, it's usually an individual sport. You're, you're on your own. You're just out there. And if you hit a bad shot, you're just out of luck. Well, my dad and I have been playing together for so many years. There's this thing that we do when we're playing partner that I, I line him up for his putts. My dad's a great putter, but I, I read the greens better. So I read the greens and I'll say it's, it's a cup out right and it's a little bit downhill. And then I'll get behind him and I'll say, here's where you're going to putt it. And I'll get behind him. Or, or on the other side of the hole, when he's lined up perfectly, I'll say, go ahead, that's in. Or I'll say, go ahead, I'll pick it up when you make it. And it's amazing how many putts, how freely he putts, how many birdie putts I pick out of the hole when we're playing together because there's somebody to line him up, there's somebody to correct him, there's somebody to affirm the decision that he's made and then to speak life into his journey. You're gonna make this putt and there's a confidence that you walk with. If you're walking alone, you're doing it. And if we're gonna take courage and we're gonna have faith, it's gotta be with the focal point being on Jesus Christ, but we're gonna need some, some friends and some family, some people to add courage to our journey. On our reaction journey, we need courage. The second thing is we need action. And some of you need action, church. That's not what I'm talking about. We, we need, we need to, to, to do something. We can't be a church that just says the right thing. We've gotta be a church that does the right thing. James 2 says, faith without works is dead. Faith without action. So we can have courage. We can have faith. That's great. But if it doesn't produce something, the Bible says it's dead and useless. On our reaction journey, we need to take action. Here's what it says. Let's drop down a couple of verses. Uh, verse 29, uh, he says, yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter, here's what I want you to get. He went over the side of the boat. He didn't think about going over to the side of the boat. He didn't theologically explain how faith would produce a miracle and, and if we get this right in the original language that I'll be able to walk on water. No, he put his faith in action and he did something and God produced a miracle. So many Christians want to pontificate ideas instead of put their purpose in action and actually help people. We gotta take action. That's why number four in our reaction statements, one of our values is we will do anything short of sin to reach people with the gospel. Anything short of sin. We're not gonna, we're not gonna be over the line just because, but we are gonna do what people aren't doing. To reach people nobody's reaching, you've gotta do things that nobody is doing. Like buying property in one of the poorest communities in Central Florida. That doesn't make any sense. I have not talked to one business person yet that thought we should go buy property in Sanford as our first permanent location, but God told us to go. He said, yes, come, and so we're over the boat. We take action when God speaks anything short of sin. We're gonna reach people. That's why I can't wait for August 5th. Do you know, church, because of your generosity that we're making available that every student, 700 students at Pinecrest Elementary School, they're gonna have a uniform because of your generosity and because of our <laughs> intentionality. And you know what? If they need two or three or four, we're just gonna provide what they need. And can I just tell you what I love about our staff and our vision is when we go into a community, we don't tell people what they need. You know, I, I'm not against this because we've done it before, but we were planning to do a backpack giveaway in Sanford. That's what we do. We've done it every single year. We've given hundreds and thousands of backpacks away. Action Church does the great backpack outreaches. You know what we found out at Pinecrest? They didn't need backpacks. They needed uniforms. Can we stop being Christians that are telling people what they need? Can we stop picking our soapbox and say, no, I'm gonna serve you this way because it's my gift and it's my passion? What if we just ask the question, what do you need? And as we meet that need and begin to develop that relationship, we earn the right to begin to tell them about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're offering every kid that comes to our service on August 13th a brand new uniform. You may say, Pastor Justin, are you bribing them to come to church? No, we call it a bait and switch. <laughs> you say, isn't that the same thing? Yes, it is. 
because we are going to promise what they want so we can give them what they actually need, and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have wants, and we're gonna meet that want, and we're even gonna meet that temporal or earthly need in the hopes that we can build a relationship and give them Jesus. We need some action, and to do that, we've gotta be encouraged, we've gotta be generous, and I thank you for being a generous church. What God has done in this last season and what what I'm getting ready to announce on August 20th, another shameless plug, you gotta be here August 20th. Because of your generosity, your continued faithfulness, we're gonna reach and connect people. We're gonna take some action. We are generous. We're gonna do anything short of sin to reach people. We need courage. We need action. Thirdly, and most importantly, we need Jesus. On our reaction journey, you can have faith and courage. You can have great ideas. You, you, can, you can be bold. You can have great outreaches. But if we're not giving them Jesus, we're wasting our time. And if we're not following Jesus, we're following the wrong thing. Here's what it says back in verse 27. Let's jump back a couple of verses. It says, take courage. And then it says, I am here. We have courage and we, we are people of action because Jesus is leading us. Jesus is here. We need Jesus. Our value here is number 10. It's the last one, and I think the most important one. And church, if you just get this, I think it will help your marriage, it will help your business, it will help your life. We live to please God, and that's it. I love you so much. I can't tell you in words how much Stephanie and I love this church. I can't tell you how much we've sacrificed and will continue to sacrifice to love you well. And we will do everything to help your family be the best that it can be. And we will do everything to reach people. But can I tell you that at the end of the day, I'm gonna be standing before God and not you. And I'm living my life to please an audience of one. And I pray that you would do the same thing. That you would have people that encourage you but that we'd quit being led astray and we'd quit being distracted by the opinions of the world when we're living to please God. Does it line up with his word? Does it line up with your spiritual authority and accountability? Well, then put your head down and continue to do the right thing. We need to follow Jesus above anything else. Peter got out of the boat, began to walk to Jesus. Have you ever been concerned that Jesus sent them into a storm. I wanna come against some, so I think some pretty poor American theology for just a second. And it's the theology that if you obey God, that your life is gonna be perfect. That can't be true. You can't preach that in Africa. You can't preach that in the Middle East. You can't preach that in South America. You can't go to people of faith that have been serving God their whole life and say, if you will just obey, then all the heartache will go away. All the storms of life will go away. That's not true. It's just not true. Jesus sent them into the storm. That's crazy, right? He said, we're here. Why? First of all, I'll give you two reasons. First of all, the, the, if you look in John's gospel, he talks about that the people were trying to make Jesus an earthly king, that the crowd that had gathered around the feeding of the 5,000, that they were trying to anoint him as earthly king because they weren't interested in a savior in eternity. They were interested in being saved right now. They were trading eternity for the temporary, and we do that too many times. So Jesus said, I can't let these guys close to me. I can't let these disciples of mine get sideways on who I am, so you guys gotta go. They're gonna try and create me into something that I'm not, so you guys have got to leave. Go out into the boat, I'll meet you there later. Just get out of here. So he sent them into the water. He sent them into the storm. Why? Because in the Bible, we find two types of storms. There are storms of correction, and there are storms of perfection. We find Jonah in the Old Testament who was running from Nineveh. He was running from his assignment. He was running from his calling. So God sent a storm and swallowed in the belly of a fish because he needed to be corrected. God had a plan for Jonah and he wasn't on the right path, so he corrected his path with a storm. 
the disciples were not disobedient. They were actually following God. They were in a storm of perfection. God knew that, God knew that he was going away. He was gonna take Jesus on the cross. He was gonna be resurrected. He was gonna ascend. And these disciples were gonna carry the church and their faith was not perfected yet because your faith cannot be perfected on the mountaintop. Your faith is perfected in the middle of the storm. So he said, I'm gonna test you. I'm gonna perfect you. Jesus Christ is the author and the perfecter of our faith. I'm gonna perfect you with this storm. We cannot believe the lie that we're not gonna face any troubles. Jesus in John 16 promises in this world, as my followers, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Victory has a name and it is Jesus, but it does not mean that we're gonna live this life separate from trials and storms. We're gonna need Jesus. What did Peter do? Remember verse 30, he, he began to sink. He began to sink, and what I need you to know is that Peter cried out in this moment when he, the Bible says when he was beginning to sink, verse 30. Notice he didn't cry out when he was drowning. You ever thought of that before? Sometimes we wait until rock bottom. Sometimes we wait until we're drowning before we include Jesus. The moment that he began to sink, he looked to Jesus. And that is a practical application in our marriage, in our relationships, in our finances, in our struggle, whatever you're struggling with. Don't wait until you're drowning. The minute that you begin to sink, take your eyes off of what's happening and put them on Jesus. When we're beginning to sink, he looked at Jesus and the Bible says immediately he was saved. Our reaction journey, we're gonna need some courage, we're gonna need some action, we're gonna need some some faith. We're gonna keep our eyes on Jesus and Jesus alone because there are miracles that are happening. You know, I read stories like this all the time. I share them um, from Action Church platform and I always get a look that like, that's a great story, Pastor, but nobody walks on water anymore. Like when's the last time that happened? Well, I don't know. I haven't seen it. I've tried it. (laughs) I'm gonna try it again this afternoon in my pool just for fun. I'm gonna run real fast. Say miracles don't happen anymore. I beg to differ. I get the pleasure of reading all the emails and and hearing all the phone calls and the voicemails and hearing our pastors talk about it. I was talking to one of our pastors just a couple of weeks ago and they were telling me this story about this family in our church. And in month eight of the pregnancy, they got the worst news ever. The baby had a condition that was going to affect its brain, therefore affect its brain's ability to tell the lungs to breathe. And the doctors were saying, this baby is gonna be stillborn. The first eight months, they had a perfectly healthy baby. Every ultrasound, every appointment, we're we're good to go. Month eight, this baby is not gonna live. I don't know if you have kids, but I, I can't imagine. I'm sure in this room there, you may have even walked that journey. I, my son has a black eye and has a CT scan and I'm, I'm up all night. I can't imagine the pain this family was going through. And at month eight, they, it's, it, it, it's over. They decide to, to have faith. They tell the story that the grandmother showed up to Saturday morning prayer every single week and began to text the prayer team and call our prayer team, some of our pastors and leaders, and they began to pray for a miracle. They began to look to Jesus. They had some courage and they had some action. It wasn't just talking about it. It was showing up every single Saturday and every single Sunday, believing God for a miracle. But the problem with with every checkup, nothing got any better. So they finally made the decision to call one of our pastors. They said, hey, would you come to the hospital? We're actually gonna do a C-section so the baby can live just a couple or two or three minutes so we can hold him, we can pray over him, and we'd love for you to come and and dedicate our, our little boy to the Lord before he goes to be with Jesus. Well, that day comes and c section is prepared and they pull out that baby. The baby comes out takes a deep breath. To be expected, it was a couple of minutes, right? They, they, they were gonna have a couple minutes with it. Well, two minutes turned to 20 minutes. And 20 minutes turned to two hours. Two hours turned to two weeks 
a baby that was told it was gonna die at birth is coming home from the hospital two weeks from now, fully healthy. <laughs> Jesus changes everything. There are times to listen to conventional wisdom and then there are times to just believe God for a miracle. There are times to listen to a, a, a doctor. I, I had it this week and this is super cheesy, you'll forgive me, but I just have to preach for just a moment. There are times when you can listen to the good doctor, but you need to look to the great physician and his name is Jesus Christ. There are times when it will just dumbfound conventional wisdom and doctor's reports. And I'm just telling you on your reaction journey, there are gonna be storms, but if you will keep your eyes on Jesus, miracles are coming your way. Because why? Because God wants the glory. I am so proud of that family. I am I'm so grateful that that baby is living. I am so grateful that he has a purpose. But even more than that, I'm grateful that we get to share his story because the most important thing is that God gets all the glory and that we worship him because of his faithfulness and because of his infinite power. That's what happened here in Matthew 14. When, when, when Peter walked on the water, he got back into the boat and it says this, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped, then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. I know doctors and family members and fellow patients at a hospital over the past few weeks are saying, you really serve the one true living God. A baby that was given a death sentence is now alive in Jesus' name. And the response, church, is to worship. We say, Pastor, that's great for Peter. That's great for baby Aaron. But what about me? I believe that God is no respecter of persons. And if you will look to him in your situation today, that Jesus changes everything. Maybe you're in here today and you're walking through something in your life that, that is holding you back. You've got these chains of addiction on your life. There is something that is just so heavy that you want to run your race, but you just feel like you're bound. Well, that's why I love in Luke's gospel, chapter four, it says that Jesus came to proclaim good news to the prisoners, to set the captives free, that those chains in your life are gonna fall today in Jesus' name. Maybe, maybe you walked in here today a little apprehensive, that there's a fear of failure, there's an anxiety, an insecurity that's keeping you from your reaction journey today. I believe that at the name of Jesus, that fear of failure and that fear Reject, rejection is going to bow today forevermore. Maybe today you have a past, so did I. You have things that you're ashamed of, so did I. And today is the day that your life is healed in Jesus' name. Psalm 146 says he heals the brokenhearted and then he binds up their wounds. That we're never the same, that we're whole in Jesus' name. Maybe you're in here today and you're hopeless. You have a, a, a desperate situation, a depression that is heavy on your life. I'm believing today that Psalm 46 is true, that God will be your refuge and ever-present help in the time of trouble, that hope is gonna be found today in Jesus' name. So what if in advance of your miracle, we just began to worship? We worship the God that saw Peter walk on the water. We worship the God that healed baby Aaron, that addiction is gonna be broken, that chains are falling, that hope is being found, fear is bowing in the name of Jesus. Come on, church at both locations, let's sing it out.
Let's do this. Every head bowed, every eye closed briefly. We're going to go outside and see some baptisms in just a moment. If you're in here today, you say, I need some hope. I need my life to be healed. I need the, the, the fear to bow at the name of Jesus. I need these chains to come off of me. It's simple. You just got to do what Peter did. You got to look to Jesus. Maybe you're beginning to sink. Maybe you've been sunk for a long time. What I promise you is the Bible is true that if you will look to Jesus immediately, immediately, like today, you will be saved. If you will surrender your life to Jesus, he changes everything. I wanna give you that opportunity today at both of our locations. If you say, Pastor Justin, I'm sinking and I need Jesus. I need him for the first time or I need to recommit my life for the first time in a long time. Today is your immediately. Today is your day of salvation. Would you slip up your hands at both locations? I need a different life. I need a different path. Got three, four, five, six here. Anybody at Oviedo, come on, raise them high so I can see you. So proud of the decision that you're making. What a moment. You can put them down at both locations. Pray this in your heart as I pray it out loud. Say, God, I love you. And God, I thank you for this free gift of salvation. God, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner saved only by your grace. And I'm confessing with my mouth and believing in my heart that you are the Lord. And I'm giving you that place today, complete and total control. God, have your way in my life. Thank you for saving me. God, we love you. I pray as a church on our reaction journey, we'd have some courage. God, we'd be people that of action. And God, we'd include you and build this thing on you, around you, through you, and following you, that you are everything to us and that we make everything about you. We love you. We praise you. It's your name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, church, at both locations. Let's celebrate the hands that just went up.